Greetings and welcome everybody to the Biblical Rose Gallery on Trinity Radio. I'm Jonathan Pritchett and with me tonight is the renowned Dr. Beeler. Hello. <laughs> How you doing? Welcome back. Great, great. You got a haircut. I did. Thanks for noticing. I uh, I needed a little update. When you get a doctorate, you got to start cutting your hair and looking professional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You 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 got uh, your doctorate from the James White School of Polemics, right? And, yeah. I mean, I I got the receipts and everything. I'm I'm renowned and uh, I'm a doctor. All right. And we have once again. Nick Quint, the New Testament theologist, who he hoped Michael Bird will one day award him a doctorate, but we'll see. When is Dr. Bird the the Australian scholar that was placed in Great Britain by the master's seminary professors? Uh, When is he coming on? I don't know. We'll have to figure out a time where it'd be fun to have him. Uh... I feel like Romans 9 through 11, we're all going to be fighting a little bit. So maybe maybe not that time. Maybe Romans 8. That'll be fun. All right. Well, tonight we're going to be... And, and by the way, I saw this uh, cute little thing on the PowerPoint you put just for me because JP wanted it. I wanted it. I wanted verse 9 this week and next week. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's that's. I'm totally cool with that. It just means you got to tell me that. Yeah, I know. We're going to close out with verse 9, but then we're going to bring it back up again next week. And so what I think about Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, I I think about this being Romans 9, part 1. Because what you get out of this really does set up what Paul goes through and what he's actually talking about in Romans 9. Would you? Would you agree with that? Yes. What do you think, what do you think Dr. Bueller? <laughs> I was trying to pull up something I have that kind of holds uh, Romans 3 and Romans 9 side by side. Uh, but, well, I don't verse, know. verse 2 <laughs> yeah. starts something Paul doesn't ever get back around to until, what, verses 4 and 5? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, in Romans 9. And, of course some of the the objections that are raised here one paul kinds of he, he kind of waves off and then gets back around to it romans 9 so um also uh, i want to bring out when when we get into the, the uh not just the interlocutor but also one of the things that i take seriously is verse 8 where he says and why not say just as we are slanderously reported and as some claim we say. So this is, this uh, helps you understand how Paul is, I think, addressing these issues as well. At, you know, it gets into the heart of why he's actually bringing up the issues that he's bringing up that he's probably dealt with in prior encounters with Jewish leadership. And he's trying to shore up his reputation with his audience at Rome because they probably slander things. But one thing that not a lot of commentators pick up on, and this could just be a Pritchett primism, and if it is, Nick, you can tell me that I'm wrong. But some of these questions from the interlocutor, these hypothetical questions that Paul brings up, if you if you take seriously this charge of slander, it and you want to be fair, it's not that Paul's knocking down a straw man, but what Paul encounters is objections to his gospel that neither he nor the interlocutor actually believe. So the interlocutor is not one to say, if our unrighteousness demonstrates the the righteousness of God, what shall we say, um, is God unrighteous for inflicting wrath, right? Right. That's that's the same as why does he still find fault? But one of the things that I picked up on is I don't think that the Jewish interlocutor believes these things that he's hurling at Paul's feet any more than Paul does. What they are doing is they are raising these kinds of objections to make Paul look bad. 
but I, mean, I don't we think know, that... we know Paul was at war with people, right? Like, you know, the I mean, Galatians one through two is basically and, and of course, basically all of second Corinthians and first Corinthians even like he's having to deal with he, Paul. I mean, we often miss it, but Paul's basically at war with a lot of fellow Christians. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Paul's having, you know, battles about the gospel wherever he goes. And I, I shouldn't say even the gospel. He's dealing with base baseline things that we think are boring. Like eating food sacrificed to idols in one Corinthians, right? Or 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 how that or the strong and the weak in, in chapters twelve through fifteen. Like Paul has made a lot, a lot of enemies in his missionary trip. Probably why Protestants like him, uh, if, if we're being honest. That's probably why we like him the most, is he just picked a fight with everyone. Um so yeah, it's it's one of those things you just notice throughout the whole letter, uh Roman specifically with the diatribe and stuff, he's I I, I suspect I suspect uh, there may be some truth to it, but I, I don't think, I don't think I, it's. I, I think I'm where you are. You're cutting in and out, and you're still a little low. But of course I, I am. Let me see. There you go. You sound yeah. a lot better, actually. <laughs> now we can hear you. <laughs> All right, so I guess it's going to be my turn to read. <laughs> and Nick, uh, you got a little trouble in our comments last week. Because you hate all, right, all English yeah, translations, and you're a snob who thinks that mere mortals who read English translations are not really getting the fullness of God's word. Is that is that is that true? Are you are you a snob, or were you being a little facetious? I'm okay with it either way, but somebody was a. Uh, taking issue with that there is that better yeah all right so we'll just go with that this whoever thinks these things are actually <laughs> worth a hill of beans you can i'm going to keep it up to myself never mind uh yeah. do i need to restate stuff or, or was i at least tell intellig intelligible enough no you were intelligible enough i guess you didn't miss all the questions about the kerfluffle and the comments about people or at least a, at least one person took issue with you being snotty about English translations because you hate all English translations and think the mere mortals who don't read the Greek Bible are not understanding God's word at all. Or were you being facetious? Being entirely facetious. Yeah, I figured, but I'm glad that you didn't let him know that in the comments. See, I do that too. People say, why did you say blah, 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 blah? What are you... And I just kind of... You know, I do that on Facebook a lot where I'll stir up a hornet's nest and then turn off notifications and move on with my life. <laughs> and yeah, let, there's a phrase for that. We're not allowed to say it on, on, on Braxton's channel. Though. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I'll read from the NASB, which I know that you're not a fan of, like, of all the translations because you booed it last week. Um, that part I know you were serious about, but mildly serious, mildly serious. If it was up to me, we'd be using the King James version just because it annoys people, especially the apologists. <laughs> I'd rather be using the King James. <laughs> it, it annoys all the, because like nobody here is a King James only us, but I like to just bug people. So uh, <laughs> we're going to use the King James. I threatened that at all of my, uh, events where people invite me to speak that I, I'm just going to use the King James just to annoy all the apologists. <laughs> Well, it beats the message. Well, yes. Not but... by much. <laughs> but anyway, so Romans 3, 1 through 9 from the NASB as determined by a poll weeks ago. Maybe we'll do another poll and see who wins. Depends on the audience of the night. Then what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First, they were entrusted with the actual words of God. I like oracles better, but okay. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Far from it. Rather, God must prove to be true, though every person be found a liar, as it is written, so that you are justified in your words and prevail in, when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not a righteous, is he? I am speaking from a human viewpoint. Far from it. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, 
why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, just as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, let's do evil that good may come of it. Their condemnation is deserved. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under <clears throat> sin. Hence the thumb <laughs> from tonight's episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe there's a few small words there you missed. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> but as an elderly man <laughs> who who is still wearing glasses, I could I can't see what they are. If it makes you feel any better, JP, I'm like, hold on, what did I put? <laughs> yeah, good. You're catching up with me. No, it just means you're extra old. Don't take that as a compliment and twist yeah. it. I, I, it's, it, it's just it's just an asterisk at uh where's the asterisk? I can't remember where I put the asterisk, but it just it's, says because JP wanted uh, to beat verse nine here. Yes, because JP wanted verse nine for both weeks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, PowerPoint man, teach us. Okay, so um, it is it was controversial 150 years ago. It is not controversial anymore. That. Uh, generally speaking, at least in terms of scholarship and, and commentaries, you read Douglas Moo, you read Robert Jewett, you read Stanley Stowers, you read Michael Byrd. Um, they all essentially agree that you've got what's called a diatribe here. Um, almost it's, and for those who don't know, it is kind of like when you take a theological, a theological mask of your opponent and put it on and speak as your opponent would an imaginary interlock what's called a uh, an interlocutor or an imaginary interlocutor and you basically use their voice so to speak to construct an argument or make a point and then you kind of take the mask off and hit it you know and all that sort of stuff so it's it'd be like for example if a, you know and we see it in sermons all the time you know or at least in, in baptist circles you see it in sermons all the time you know you know some some might say you know that you know, sprinkling children is a sin, but I say to you, you know, so you can see, you know, that's kind of a simplistic way of saying it, but that's kind of the general idea. Um, and so that's what Paul's kind of doing. He's he's constructing an, uh, an imaginary, quote unquote, imaginary opponent, how uh, imaginary or real is, for me, a, a bit vague. Um, I'm not entirely certain. Um, we don't have a person named as the kind of the, the actual interlocutor. Um, we still, there's still a lot of scholarly debate on who it is. Generally speaking, it seems to be, as we saw last week, um, the interlocutor is, was it Jewish JP that we concluded that we all kind of agree to the interlocutor yeah. is Jewish. Yeah. But yeah. there has been a few mon major monographs and articles that have come out. Um, specifically there's one out of Duke university. I'd have to go and read it. Um, that argues that from chapter two, verse 17 and onward, uh, Paul has a Jewish interlocutor, or not, was it was it a Jewish interlocutor? I think it might have been a Gentile. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, don't man. quote me on any of that. Um, I don't think a Gen. I don't. I think it's a Jewish interlocutor all the way up to chapter eleven. Mm. I suspect that's possibly true. Um, I suspected that I'm right. But point being, uh, that at least I think I'm right, and nobody has convinced me of otherwise. So, well, I mean, I, I don't object to it. I just. I don't know if how far the interlock, how deep the interlocutor goes. I don't know if I want to do the Douglas Campbell thing where, you know, the, the stuff that's the most dis, dis, uh, disturbing in Paul becomes an interlocutor, so to speak. But anyway, um, point being. No, I just think I just think that in chapter two, just because it doesn't come out right and say it in verse one, doesn't mean that just like chapter one, 18 and following has stuff that resonates with. Jews that sets up for chapter two. Chapter two can have relevance to Gentiles, and yet the interlocutor still be Jewish. But Paul's yep. happy for the Gentiles to overhear. And then everyone agrees that verse 17 is explicitly Jewish, but I'm not buying the, the could be any man. Um, I, I use the image of if, if the interlocutor shoe fits for you, then Paul's speaking about your shoes, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I think primarily he has a Jewish, uh, a Jewish interlocutor in mind. Mm -hmm. But all that to say, you've got those sorts of things kind of in the, in the background of the text and in chapter two. So um, the diatribe and what's called prosopopoia or speech and character will be um, utilized throughout Romans. Specifically, we'll see in Romans 7. Um, 
and who, who, who's the speaker, or who's the I, so to speak. Um, but we're given a glance of how Paul uses that here. Um, so basically, when we do these, these co- uh, our commentary on Romans, everything becomes more layered and more um, cyclical. Paul kind of re, re, uh, re, uh, utilizes material or concepts again and again to kind of bolster a point. Um, and kind of Romans has kind of created its own echo chamber, so to speak, of, of ideas. Um, now, I haven't read Dr. Bird's commentary on Romans. I know he wrote one mm-hmm. a few years ago. Um, but is is in a series that really didn't interest me much. Um, but what was you and I have already had a Roman seven title here on Trinity Radio. You guys can all look it up. And Nick thinks he won. I, I disagree. But um, what does who does who does um, Doctor Bird identify the uh, I as? Uh, I don't think he agrees with either of us. He's not. This is Paul's struggle as a Christian guy, is he? I I couldn't tell you I, the commentary. I went to the office today and picked up eight books, and that was uh, book number nine that did not make the cut to come home. Um, I, I I don't think he's I don't think he's uh, with Adam or Israel. Um, so I I couldn't tell you uh, what he actually what he what he thinks on that. Okay. Well, you can ask him the next time he talks to you. But he's such a busy Christian influencer now. Um, <laughs> it's kind of superseded his uh, priestly vocation in the Anglican Church and teaching people at Ridley College. No, like, that's not true. We all know Anglicans were the first social influencers. So, oh, there you go. Uh, so there you all go. that. All right. All well, that, what do you make of? Okay, so there's not much um, dispute now, like you said, on on this being a diatribe in this section. But what about chiasmic structure? What about? Um, what do you what do you make of the inclusio the what thens refrain, the the repetition? Uh, I I don't find chiasmus to be particularly helpful. Um, well, I, I think it's particularly obvious whether or not you agree it was anywhere in Romans chapter two. I think it's less obvious here, but I think it's definitely obvious and conscious and present in Romans five twelve through twenty one. So it's not like, I mean, it just, you can't, I, I don't, I don't know of any convincing argument that Romans 5, 12 through 21 is not chiastic and not intentional. Yeah. Chi- chiasm is something I think we more utilize to help us make sense of the passage. I'm not sure they quite thought like that. I'd have to read more Porter and Stowers on that. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I think, so it's the question- de- I think it was definitely there in chapter two, but we, y'all can go back and watch that episode. I think it was two or three weeks ago. We explained what that was. Uh, a, B, C, D, C, B, A structure of phrases. Right. Uh, so it's just, and then um, I don't, I don't care if what people make it here. And I don't think that there, I, I do agree with um, Longenecker where he says that there's probably no inclusio, purposeful here now i will argue that there is a purposeful inclusio from romans chapter 5 verse 1 and then romans eight thirty nine, and that that I, I think that that is an intentional one that that circles back um to close out that entire section i think it's a good paul intentionally framed it that way but as like a a mini thing here no i don't i don't think so no so a question that arises, at least I thought was interesting, and I've not settled on it. Um, in verse, in chapter three, verse one, you have an un, uh, basically a rhetorical therefore, which can be kind of a uh, post-positive kind of on the basis of this having been said, and then you kind of you kind of move on. But it's not denoting a severance of the train of thought. It's denoting a kind of a marker, kind of put a pin in it. And basically, we're still moving on. So if you imagine, for example, um, we, all, we all know the meme, right, of Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He's got the, the board spread out, and he's you know, got the crazy look. He's got the pieces of string tied to tacks, and they're all kind of forming oh, a Oh, the circle. conspiracy theory Yeah, the conspiracy meme. theory yeah. meme. You know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, it's that. Uh, basically, if Paul's argument is a, is a thread, he's tied it into one tack, he's put it on the board, and he's moved it to the next tack, and the, and the therefore here is a tack. So basically, you have the through you have the thread through line that goes through, but here you have a distinct a distinct marker that points out. Okay, Paul's now doing something you wouldn't say new here, but he's there's another sort of um, layer to the foundation of the argument that he's building. And so mm-hmm. the question is, um, um, what? Uh, and I've got let me pull it. What then? What then? Or therefore? 
Uh, see, that's why I'm looking at the NASB for their literalism or their woodenism. I'm like, that's not very wooden here, guys. Then what uh, advantage does the Jew have? And so that, that kind of becomes the question. And that's a very fair question. Question, I think, of an interlocutor to kind of, you know, well, kind given of what, up, you know, yeah, given what Paul had just said, and given what Paul had just said in chapter two, uh, it is a very fair question because he's already he's already castigated the Jews being right there alongside, and he's going to do it again. Uh, <laughs> but I, I see this little section here as a brief, like you said, stick a pin in it because I'm going to clean up what I just said. Because I do think that the question's somewhat fair, um, mm -hmm. this rhetorical question, because you expect Paul to say none, but he goes in the right. different direction and says, um, <laughs> great in every possible way, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You would expect a negative response. You would expect him, because he's already basically made, he's already slapped, made a, you know, he's already rhetorically slap someone you'd expect him to continue beating his opponent down you know bam 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 you know, like the cartoons just wham but here you don't get that um you get what advantage or or um i i remember the verb is, or the word is very yeah what yeah that's right what extraordinary eminent remarkable what um uh, what is remarkable about being a jew is kind of you know then what's the point of all that right um someone decides to play in here well we'll just roll with it uh, what advantage is there to being a jew uh, or the value or the weight of um yeah or yeah value of circumcision you know the th the very things of our history the very things that god gave to us the, the the markers of identity you know all these sorts of things that we all do because god told us to do it what what advantage of it is god and that's of course where the question of supersessionism comes in or replacement theology and we'll, we'll tackle that more when we get to Romans 9. But that issue, I think, is a very live issue. And we see that, of course, in the next century, at least in the early second century, of the party of the famous party of the ways between Jew and Gentile. Um, yeah. Paul had to wrestle with this from Galatians to Romans to Colossians. to the, like it, That's one of the key through lines of Pauline theology um, that he's constantly having to deal with with his, his churches is when you got Jew and Gentile sitting together and eating together and having fellowship together and, and men and women sitting together and slave and free sitting together and all these sorts of things. There's going to yeah. be social conflict, and that's where this is. This is a question of status, but and of social conflict, but also of history. How does this all work now that this new thing we weren't expecting is being done by God, and you're the one saying that God is doing this? How does this all work? So, it's a big question that spawns yeah, lots of little raised, questions. Since you raised the issue of second century and kind of the parting of the ways, uh, Forster and Marston. I don't know if you ever read their book, God's Strategy in Human History. Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty good book. They've updated it, but um, I haven't read the update, and I, I too read it a long time ago. But they they made the point that that um, this movement, this that God's strategy, um, was largely successful. The provoking Jews to jealousy, and then waiting for more Jews to c come to Christ. That the reason it was the parting parting of the ways is that a significant number of Jews ended up converting to Christianity. And Judaism, um, you could say, started to shrink over subsequent centuries, you know. Um, and it, it, it's really not a very, I mean, we think of it as a major world religion given its Abrahamic roots, but it's even in the present, it's not a very large uh, religion. And, you know, even taking into account World War II, you know, um, it still hadn't had sizable numbers in centuries, you know? Hmm. So, yeah. but their argument was way back in the seventies was that the reason for that was, was largely because the strategy that God was using. Um, and then with the collapse of the temple and all of that in 70, that it was largely successful. Um, probably more so in the diaspora than in Jerusalem itself, but still, I mean, if you read the early chapters of Acts, you get a sense of the thousands that were coming to Christ. Uh, in the Holy Land. I'd be interested mm -hmm. in that, reading that. Yeah, they, they have an update version. It was kind of, it was kind of their pushback, is a 70s version of, of pushing back against Calvinism. So it's a... And it, you also have um, uh, James Dunn's, uh, the third volume of his... I forget exactly what it's called, what the series is called, but it's, it's a big book, it's like a thousand pages. 
Uh, neither Jew nor Greek, a contested identity. So volume one, you know, thousand pages. Um, I can't remember, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it focuses on, on the early strata of the resurrection, basically kind of what Dale Allison was doing, you know, resurrection hypothesis and kind of the historical stuff. Then the second one is the second volume is kind of the expanse from cross to, uh, like Paul and, and, and acts. Uh, well, actually Paul, Paul and, you know, early, early letters and stuff like that. Um, and then volume three is, you know, early, late, late New Testament, you know, maybe Acts, Revelation, Hebrews, and dealing with that sort of question of supersessionism, Gentile and Jew relations, and kind of where that all kind of went. So it's, it's a very interesting series from kind of a, you might say, a critical British sympathet- sympathetic to evangelicalism, but not evangelical, at right. least in an it's, American sense, kind of Jimmy scholar. Dunn. From yeah, Jimmy I mean, Dunn, yeah. James Dunn. Uh, I, I actually, I like his work typically even, I when I don't, even when i don't agree with it which is you know more i view him cool. like i view douglas moo it's like boy this is this is very helpful you're wrong about everything but i can't, I can't i'm so happy i read this yeah this is the same with uh greg boyd um i mm. uh i don't agree with a lot of his conclusions but man i love to read his work and i mean he's a very astute scholar um for sure Man, I was just I was just thinking, Nick, because you said he, he's got this work and you're like, it's a thousand pages. And I was like, man, why can't these guys break this stuff up into volumes? And you're like, that's they volume did. one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, here, here's what I found. Uh, sometimes thousand page books are faster reads than 200 page books that are terrible. And um, I learned this back in seminary. This I know we're getting off topic, but, you know, there's this- we can do what we want. We're adults. Yeah. Um, when I looked at the resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright for my uh, apologetics class on the resurrection, uh, first I was thrilled that it wasn't just like the Habermas uh, thing, which I love Lycona's book, but it's a different kind of animal than what Wright was talking about. But usually good authors uh, are British. <laughs> and, and, and when you read it in British accents in your mind, uh, it goes by quick because you think that everything that you're reading sounds a lot smarter than if an American wrote it. But that's not really what I want to say. Typically, what they'll do is they'll they'll subsection it to death to where you're reading just like a page and a half of a section, no more than three to five pages. And then you're bam on to the next thing. And so you feel like you move through it so fast. And I originally read that book uh, on Kindle. And so I wasn't aware uh, of where I was as far as, you know, I don't know what location means because uh, there's like 10 different numbers. I'm like, I don't know what page this is. So, but, but it seems like I read that book in under a week. And then when I looked it up, you know, on Amazon to see how big the book was on the paperback version, I was like, oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. That would usually take um, me much longer. Had I had it in my head, it was a large book. But you can actually get through large books pretty quickly if it's, if it's well written. Uh, we have a question here that we'll go ahead and take now uh, since we're already derailing the show. Uh, Amber asks, is there something in the way that Paul uses that therefore phrase that would imply a historic use that would be a device as a type of rhetorical implied a no answer that makes Paul's yes a surprise? I would say no, uh, but it is a it is a rhetorical device to connect things. Uh, to uh, it is a rhetorical device, but there's nothing about the therefore that that anticipates the surprise answer. But it is, it is. I a, think you could argue that actually. I mean, I, I agree with you. On the one hand, you have the thread, the through line. You know that you know he's not he's not cutting it off and jumping to another topic. The topic's continuing. He's just doing it like a subsection or or a pivot within the road. You know, turning the corner. Um, I think, and I put this in there: the shock of the positive, like. Basically, Paul, you would expect Paul on basis of maybe misunderstandings of Galatians, like Galatians 3, you know, um, and Galatians 2, perhaps, and other texts, that if if Galatians is written before Romans, and that's most likely, not 100%, but it's more likely, um, then Paul's reputation as a libertine, you know, law-free, and that, you know, that's not what James actually says. You know, James does. James 2 is not saying anything like that. Him and Paul are basically biblical theologian buddies, you know, if you actually read them correctly. But you can see that there is a sense of Paul's legacy is precedes him, you know. And so here, he's basically, he could be playing off the historic or what people have heard about what he says. 
and pl- playing it up and them expecting a, well, that's exactly what I said, because Jew and Gentile are da da da. There's no, there's no benefit in being a Jew for this, this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. But instead, he doesn't, which I think would probably shock them because you know, they're expecting that answer. They're expecting, yeah, we've yeah. heard all this sort of stuff. He's an apostle to the Gentiles, so he's going to, you know, he's going to do all this. And Paul's like, no, the, Je- the Jews are wonderful. I'm a Jew. And he, that's why, you know, he builds that up and why he, you know, in Romans 9, for example, just to bring that in a bit. I wished myself to be accursed for uh, for my brothers and sisters, right? Like this is not someone who is disinterested in that sort of question, and well, so I think I, I think it, is, it, it, the response would shock them. Yeah, uh, no, because that, that I agree that with. What I would say is just using "un" doesn't necessarily, in Paul, necessitate a surprise next thing that he's about. Un to say. as itself, no, but "un" within the context here, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when um, people say head means authority. It's like, no, it doesn't. Head means head. Head means the thing on top of your neck. How it gets used, or rhetorically how words get used, yeah. that's where the question is. It's not, do word, does head mean authority? We all know it doesn't. Head means head, until yeah, an yeah, author takes yeah. the idea of what it is and plays with it. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't use it as a hermeneutic rule that you're going to be, that Paul's going to say something necessarily that, that flips the script every time he, that word comes up, or any biblical author as a rhetorical device. But you should anticipate um, that therefore uh, is going to tell you what it was there for, to use the old preacher joke. Um, But what I think this is like the exception that proves the rule, right? Because the fact that you you anticipate the negative answer and it gives the surprise positive response, um, great in every respect, that's, it kind of leads, because you expect, you know, the therefore to say uh, none whatsoever, you're, you're, you know, you have no advantages at all. Um, mm-hmm. But, but the fact that it does bring the surprise, I think is more of the exception that proves the rule in this particular um, instance. Right. You know? Yeah. And so but it's like, therefore the all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. No one would bat an eye to that. Um, and like Romans two, one, right. You know, you, you, you who judge, right? You know, he flips at the script. I don't think they'd find that that shocking. This, I think they'd be a little more like, um, weren't you just telling us that we aren't special? You know, that yeah, sort of thing. We're not special. That's, that's where I think they're. Gentiles yeah. who aren't circumcised, their uh, obedience becomes circumcision and our circumcision <laughs> becomes uncircumcised. And then now you're saying, you know, uh, and it's interesting that he brings up circumcision, right? Mm-hmm. because he, he says what advantage and then he goes back to the issue of circumcision because that and this is where I, I think you know old perspective people don't pick up on these cues uh, and why they kind of poo poo a lot of the, the I, even the apocalyptic tradition or the new perspectives however you want to say it to make Nick Hag, that they don't understand that the, the the identity marker is a real thing, right? That the mm-hmm. these the mm-hmm. identity plays an important role, and these the these markers, kosher circumcision, things like that, um, they are at play more more than people realize. And now I I will side with the old perspective to say that that's not all that Paul means by works, right? That these 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 identity. But what it does do, it does do uh, the work of putting national identity front and center all throughout Romans, which the old perspective doesn't pick up on. And so they're thinking about the individual trying to find, you know, the individual wicked sinner trying to find grace from a holy God, all that. And they, they take that route when they're not realizing that Paul's, I mean, number one, let's take seriously the collectivist culture of the ancient Mediterranean world. Number two, he's dealing with big pictures and big ticket items and people groups. And that matters. And that affects the way that you're going to read Romans outside of Martin Luther's existential crisis. Mm -hmm. Yep. So all uh, all of this uh, 36 minutes on a uh, on a on a on an oon. Basically, I'm loving this. We're we're gonna be here for days, friends. Yeah. So w- w- yeah. <laughs> okay. So when when so first they were entrusted with the actual words of God, you you want us to talk about proton, right? Well, it, it just brings that we've already kind of mentioned it, but just you know, first, but there's no second. You know, basically, you know, 
you'd expect, you know, first this, and then you'd expect a, a sequence or a list uh, and that sort of stuff. Uh, there is one. Or, 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 well, yeah, there six is. Six chapters Just, later. <laughs> yeah, six chapters later, you know. Um you know, much in every way, or first, or first of all, you know, da da da. And so you're just kind of like, it's just one of those odd things where I just noticed that I was like, wait, where's where's Proton? And where where does <laughs> where's the second? <laughs> you know, because you know, so it's just interesting. Just um, the well, only yeah, other thing. I mean, I, go. The the, the uh, highly esteemed Trinity professor of preaching, uh, David Allen, um, reminds us to take notes before you consult the commentary. Make notes of the features. You know, the oddities and every little detail that you can pick up on your own. And one of those mm -hmm. things that you're looking for is, well, he says first here, and we always think this is going to trigger off a sequence, but there's no sequence. <laughs> right. So, mm -hmm. so yep. that's something that you should make note of as you're going through a text. Uh, and I, and I do think uh, that's why I, I don't like verse by verse commentaries because you need to go pericope by pericope section by section, because that way you can, you can digest, I mean, you're wanting to drill down on the one hand, but you don't want to drill down so atomistically that you lose sight of the, you know, you're not even looking at a tree anymore. You're looking at a piece of bark on a tree and then you can go all kinds of crazy without that. So uh, my, my recommendation, and I try to do this and I'm bad at it, but um, when you're going to study a book that you want to, and I know some books are longer than others, but when you want to study a book, listen to it and on audio from start to finish all the way through before you ever do anything else. Mark up your Bibles too. That's why God gave yeah. them to you. Well, I, I say, listen to it. Don't read it. Listen mm -hmm. to it. Specifically, if you can get someone with a British accent, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So, oh, okay, I can go to sleep to this. Yeah. Wait, it's not literally verse by verse. Well, well Paul yeah. Didn't what do you mean? Verse by like, verse. Like, like I thought exegesis was taking each verse dissecting every bit of the greek and staying within the chapter and you have to go in order like is that are you, are you saying that's not how it is um i don't think so um there's there's a, a lot of work this is what we talked about in the first episode there's a lot of work you got to do before you even get into the text you've got to create the content remember biblical documents are written for the ear they're not written for the eye most people did not just sit there and silently read their bibles they didn't have bibles to silently read and so these things are written for the ear. And that's why I always tell people, uh, I, I do count audiobooks as reading, but when it comes to the Bible, it was originally written for the ear. So you need to listen to it and listen to it all the way through and then learn everything you can about Rome in the first century and all of that historical stuff. And then once you go to the historical stuff, go beyond that to the sociological, sociocultural stuff and the ideological context and, the, and all of that. And the... Um, you know, the theological well, context. Well, what can you, what can you surmise from the audience? What would, you know, what can you surmise from the author's life? All of that has to be laid down before mm -hmm. you, uh, that's, that's step one of exegesis. And, and so for all the kerfluffles that we, you know, everyone's taking shots. This all goes back to a recent debate that Trinity professor Layton Flowers had uh, against um, Dr. White. Um, exposition is not exegesis, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was saying is micro Jesus is not exegesis. Uh, it's important to analyze the, the Greek, but you, a lot of people don't do enough of the historical. And that's why whatever they lay on the grammatical, they're making up because they didn't do enough work on the historical part of the grammatical historical hermeneutic. So to make it to, to, to for those maybe an obvious chat, example um, of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago when when they talk about grace and they don't have any any sort of commentary on benefaction and gift giving and patronage and in, in, in the age of, and they're talking about God's grace and they're and, and they they offer no they haven't done any work they're not telling you anything about the New Testament Derek you're so waving it, your arm <laughs> oh go ahead Derek I'll, I'll wait oh no because. I was I was making a joke because sometimes we, we were talking on Twitter about how sometimes they conceive of grace like it's a sprinkling on of something onto somebody. So I was just mimicking the action. Like Oh, oh yeah, that comes from uh, old Trinity oh. Radio where I said pixie dust. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a, yeah. A, a pixie dust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one one here's what I uh, what I told people at uh, at seminary or not seminary, when I told people I was in seminary. I said, All right. If, do you have one hundred dollars? And they said, yes. And I'm like, and these people want to study the Bible. 
I'm like, do you have a hundred dollars? Yes. I'm, okay. Go buy Josephus. Start with Joseph. Buy Josephus. Read Josephus. It's all you can get Josephus for fifteen bucks. You can probably get it cheaper than that. Use use copy. Uh, don't buy Luther. Don't buy Calvin. Don't don't buy Wesley. As much as I love Wesley, don't buy Wesley. Buy Josephus. Buy Philo. Buy Tacitus. Buy Suetonius. Buy all like buy first century Greco Roman and Jewish authors. Uh, you Plutarch. can get for fifty bucks Plutarch for fifty bucks. You can get the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, two volumes. One is apocalyptic literature. The other is uh, philosophical literature, and it's it's incredibly helpful. If you read those, if you took six months and you just read those, and Philo is difficult to read. Basically, imagine if the Gospel of John took acid and steroids, and decided to reread Moses through Plato. That's what you get with Philo. But Philo is worth reading if you can just kind of figure out, you know, what he's going through. But he's not gonna. He's he's very helpful, but he's difficult to read. But if you got those, you know. Eight, nine books. Let's say you got nine volumes right there. For 100 bucks, you could probably get them all for 100 bucks. Um, you use second hand and all that. You and if Tacitus, you spent six, six months reading that. Yeah, you can get Tacitus, Suetonius. I, I would throw in Seneca. You can get all that free online, or you can go yeah. just some yeah. Penguin Classics at a used bookstore for a dollar. Yeah, you so you can get all those for 100 bucks or less. Put them on yeah. your shelf. Read those read how they and just look you know read and read your bible of course but read those over the course of six, three to six months digest them and then when you pick up the bible it'll be like you've been reading it's like your first introduction to michael heiser or nt right you, you won't be able to go back because you'll see yeah. things you go oh i know exactly what he's talking about if you read plutarch on marriage and you read paul you're like wow there is strong continuity and there is a lot of discontinuity when it comes to sexual ethics between these two authors you know but you can see that they're operating within a shared world but they're not uncritical of the air they breathe you know, a good philosopher like plutarch is not uncritical um and so that's what i tell people is like spend a hundred dollars buy those books read them for three months it's not hard to um it's not hard to do it just takes the time to do it and yes john barclay's book on paul and the gift fantastic book um get his smaller book paul and the power of grace for a lot cheaper and a lot less, e a lot easier to read. Yeah. That, but, I that's mean, the one I read. I, I like yeah, it. It's a good book. Very good book. Very good book. Um, but this stuff, I mean, the context group has been talking about this for uh, back when it was a thing uh, for yeah. decades. I mean, you can go back and read like Pilch and Melina and De Silva and all those guys. And, and they would, Barclay did, Barclay just made the compendium, compendium on, on this topic. But and it's a lot of historiography through the ages. But um, I recommend looking up all the authors of the old context group, and and they were talking about this um, a long time ago. Um, this is nothing new. It's just it, these things take a while to. And what this is what's weird. Um, granted, we have a lot more documents than we used to, but I mean, both Luther and Calvin read extensively some of the greco-roman literature i mean they they reference a lot of good stuff i mean they had they mm -hmm. had uh they were well read and i'm not to take it away from any of these guys um i'm glad that they did read those things but they kind of they kind of treated the bible as um falling from golden tablets like the mormons do and think of it as totally disconnected from everything <laughs> else that they had read and they just kept bouncing those off like this is not anything like it couldn't be anything like this and um, Calvin got a little bit better in his commentaries, but it just seems like they just did not know what to make of it. And they didn't read those very well. And they didn't read um, the Bible, in my opinion, very well either at mm -hmm. very various points. But well, it's like Michael Heiser says, they did the best they could with what they had. They, I disagree. They had. You don't agree with that. <laughs> so you're saying they did have the resources. They just didn't deal with those very well. They had enough, but it just didn't seem like to me they had enough resources. They just. Um, um, they, I don't think they cared. Like honestly, during right. that time, like I don't, I don't think they cared as much as we do. And, and to be fair, we have the hol we we read these Jewish texts in light of the Holocaust. They don't. Yeah. So there's that too. Yeah. Well, and I mean, they were Protestants, so. But I mean, it's not like, you know, th I mean, thanks to Christians, we had all that pagan literature preserved for thousands of years, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. yep, all your pagan that. literature belongs to us. That's right. Yep. All right. Uh, the uh, 46 did, minutes. Did we, ever, did we ever answer the question of how far back in chapter two you guys think it goes? I think it goes back probably to probably to chapter one or chapter two, verse one in terms of echoes. But I think it's more just the, the previous thing we talked about last week, the 17 through 29. 
is my immediate guess. Uh, yeah. But I didn't know because it, it's, you can't really tell because it's not like he goes, mm. as, as I said, from these verses to this point, it's more just whatever mm. he said in chapter two on he's is probably should be ringing in your ears like a bell. How far back it goes depends on what's relevant. Romans 1, 18 through 32, probably relevant, but at the secondary level, the primary echoes and the ringing would be first chapter two verses one to the end of the chapter. My sense. Okay. Now, well, go ahead. Yeah. So, so, uh, um, no, 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 no. He should, he should go ahead. You and I talk way too much, Bridget. Go yes, ahead. Go ahead. Doctor. Uh, okay. So, cause I was, I read through chapter two, like three or four times whenever I was trying to answer that question, because I'm like, I, I could see it in verses one through 11, just, I mean, maybe depending on how you define the you there. Um, and I didn't think it was too explicit, like in, like once you get to verse 12 through 16, but I could, I could kind of see it there and kind of 17, but I think it, I, I don't think you can deny that at least, it goes back to verse 25 because because in his question in chapter three, verse one and two, he, he mentioned circumcision, whereas verse 25 brings in circumcision. So we, I think we can at least say he goes back to that. But I, I honestly, as I was assessing the chapter, it does seem like he's building up for that. And then and then he gets pretty explicit with it and then asks the question. It's like, all right, now that I built this all up um, and it seems like I'm kind of putting the Jews and the Gentiles on equal footing. That's why you get the shock value of the, the, the positive answer to the question is because he spent so much time building that up. And then they're like, like, oh, OK, so of course he's going to answer that. Yeah, just what he's been building up. But no, actually, shock value. I like I do want you guys to see how they are kind of on equal footing in these respects. But let's keep Israel in its proper in its proper place where it does have the advantage with the word of God. Yeah. Well, and you, I think it, I think you could uh, you could make the case that chapter two verse one is is the initial is including that because uh, ten and eleven or nine you know there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of of mankind who does evil for the Jew first and also for the Greek so already mm -hmm. there you've got that but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek and then you have the language of where there's no partiality with God mm -hmm. which you would expect them ba on the basis of that as you were pointing out Derek rightfully so I think that that sort of what does partiality, uh, no partiality with God mean? For them, Paul is playing, going to start playing with that. And that's why the shock value, they're expecting that. But he does, he, he shocks them by not giving them the answer they want. Um, although it's probably not the answer they expected, but it's the answer they probably, if they were thinking a certain way, would actually conclude on their own. Yeah, it's important so, the, to, to say that, that the no partiality point is that there's no partiality in judgment because in light mm -hmm. of human sin... Not mm -hmm. that there wasn't any advantages whatsoever to being Jewish. And that's a right. very subtle thing to bring up here, which is right now. No, um, uh, I did want to ask you about this, Nick, because I mean, I'm happy with Wagia being oracles, but are you, you, you know, more of a let's just keep it straight word here, you know? Well, it's, I'm just going to complain. The NASB is like, we're literal and wooden. I'm like, then you wouldn't have translated it this way. I actually like oracles. I think oracles makes a lot of sense contextually and theologically. Um, it just begs the question, the word, the words of God. It's like, okay, but my first thought was, all right, what, what words are we talking about here? Are we talking about, I think I have Old Testament, you know, just kind of the Old Testament spoken word. Are we talking about the words of the prophets? Are we talking to direct revelation from God? You know, God speaking. Um, I would like, say, what, I would how say. Far, how far, how, how wide is the, the, the language of Lagia, right? How wide gonna, is that language? I'm going to say. My answer is yes, because um, while I'm, you know, I, I I wouldn't argue this way, like in an Albert Moeller, Norman Geisler kind of way, that when Paul equates um, scripture and Moses and God in Romans chapter nine, that that you can just kind of gloss over every the whole canon with that. Um, I I agree with that. I'm just saying I wouldn't argue that way, right? Um, but I, I think for certain here in Romans, I would definitely argue that way, that what Paul is talking about is everything that he marshals from the Septuagint that he understands that he shares in common with both the Jews and Gentile hearers of this letter. Not that unbelieving Jews would, 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 would catch wind of this. They might. But I mean, he's expecting his Jewish Christian and Gentile Christian audiences to see that canon as shared authoritative oracles of God. 
that that if it came from the prophets, Paul would say that's from God. If it came from even the psalmist, that came from God. If it came from Moses, that came from God because Moses was God's original eschatological agent in the Exodus. And so, um, I would I would say yes to that um, to all of it. So so Logion um, is used four times in the New Testament. Um, I'll just quickly go over them. Um, it's used in Acts seven thirty eight. Um, and I'm just going to read from the NIV because that's just was what jumped up to me. Uh, he was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, so Moses, and with our ancestors, and he received living words or or logia, on, or logia to pass on to us. And so already, we probably shouldn't be thinking of this as words, as in like we often think word of God. You know what I mean? Like you know that sort of thing. Um, you probably would see it as something more along the lines of um, like divine communication ex uh, in the form of God speaking whether through a prophet or through or through moses or through that so in one sense i, I think i'm with you pritchett it's it's a expansive term but it probably denotes more a sense of what we might if we want to be very paraphrastic with it to kind of make it make sense you know instead of being literally you take a more message to understanding just to make it clear you would say um god's divine communication with the very com with the divine com communication that comes from god or something well, like when that. you say divine communication though that evokes the word oracle as a, as a great way to say it because of the religious connotations yeah. to that which is word. why i'm not opposed to oracles actually and that's why i think right. it's actually a more fair a more appropriate trend english translation of a very expansive right. contextually we're, not, expansive we're, not, word. we're not just talking about nick's words or just words right i right. mean there's a yeah there's there's a there's a highly charged twinge of divinity in in the language or in the words that he's speaking about which would be the oracles that, that they all held in common the author paul with his audience both the jew and gentile believers here so i'm i'm happy with that um now you talk about this conflict between God and humanity because this does um, the 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 what is it? There's four of these um, questions, right? Um, yep. In this section here, and so the first um, what then that we talked about would be if some do not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? This is an important question that I also yep. think gets overlooked in the Reformed commentaries. That this, I yep. mean. Paul is trying to, uh, in in my mind, um, because the sum and and we could say most <laughs> at this period in time, um, the, this the sum do not believe their belief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, God's actual commitment to the covenant, and when you gloss over this, um, the reason. Paul uses, I'm speaking from a human viewpoint, you could take that little parenthetical and move it up to here because if if a Jewish interlocutor is going to get on board with what Paul's saying, right, this puts God in a very, very awkward spot, it seems, that, remember, Paul's already laid down in his um, epistolary opening, right, <clears throat> that this was promised long ago. He's already he's already covered that ground, right? He's already said that. Um, so, uh, if if this you know he promised beforehand through his prophets prophets in the Holy Spirit uh, in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, right? So he, this is a been there done that thing, and so if if um, people aren't believing that. Remember, go back to the thesis statement. This argument ties into the um, not ashamed of the gospel. Paul's got to show why, <laughs> right? And he's got to he's got to make the argument that um, they're not accepting this does not mean that God has not been faithful to the covenant. Now he's he's not going to get into addressing how God was faithful to the covenant, even though he already said it, and it's the, you know, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, right? So he's already said this, but these are the objections to that idea, and so he's got to address those objections, and that's why I said, even though Romans 9 through 11 is a refutatio portion of his letter here, um, he's already... Uh, 
preempting or, or laying down markers for what he's going to get into later in chapter nine. And uh, you've got to kind of follow along with this. And so God would look from a Jewish perspective, if they're going to get on board with what Paul's saying, that God's in a pretty awkward situation. Because if they had the words of God, these oracles of God, and yet they're not believing, is either A, comes back to, did the word of God fail, Romans 9, but either either God's in an awkward situation, how do you get him off the hook, or B, you aren't representing the God of our covenant. Yeah, the, the character of God is at stake in basically this sort of section here, and it gets played out further in Romans, well, from this point on, I think, I think yeah. the major sub theme theologically is the character of God. Is is God faithful to his to his promises? Um, and you got the language of there. You know, you have the interplay of we're entrusted with the oracles of God. You know, pistio uh, language. You know, pist pistis verb. And then, what if some were not that faithful? You know, they were entrusted with something. What did they do with it? And so there is that kind of interplay already between divine and human agency, God's faithfulness, human unfaithfulness with the gifts that God has given to them, or the proclamation that God has given to them. Does their apistia, their their non faith, or their faith, or their untrustworthiness, perhaps? Um, nullify, or I mean, that's a katargeto verb. That's like a when agents do things to one another. You don't want to be katargetoed by another agent. Usually, that means like killed or or broken or slaughtered or something. Um, does does their faithlessness or or what have you um, undo or break the faithfulness of God? The character of God is at stake here. Basically, if they're not being if if God's own people are being aren't being faithful to Him then what does that say about that relationship? And how can Paul therefore take the, his Jewish self to the Gentile or the pagan nations, believe, pro proclaiming that the Jewish Messiah has been raised from the dead, that the God, Yahweh, he worships is all of these things and take and go there and preach all these things when the people in his churches don't agree. In fact, you got, it's like, it's like ethical supersessionism between Jew and Gentile here. And Paul's like, no, the whole point is the is that God is is faithful to his people, when, even when you aren't faithful. And it doesn't say all, it's some. Tinas, right? So it's not all people, it's some. And so it's one of those where you're, he's having to navigate kind of the old, old, Old Testament story of how much faithfulness is required of the remnant. And that's the whole point. Yeah, again, Romans 9, nine not all Israel is. I mean, this, <laughs> you cannot exactly. separate, the, the, you got to keep all this in mind. Now, um, this is going to. This next question I have for you is going to anticipate something we're going to probably get deep into the weeds two weeks from now when we get into twenty one through thirty one, if we get to bite that off. Uh, never mind fights about penal substitution, but um, apostia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Transla translated here, uh, unbelief in the NASB, but shouldn't it be? unfaithfulness yeah the esv and the uh, the esv has faithlessness and nav has unfaithfulness i almost wonder if trustworthiness is does their lack of trust in their proclamation and their use of the the oracles of god or fulfilling the divine covenant nullify god's own faithfulness and that actually anticipates romans romans 11 that the gifts and calling of god given to his people are given without regret not irrevocable i'm, I'm already annoyed when i hear when i read that translation it's given without regret god does not regret his calling of israel you know right. and and that sort of thing so i i think i don't i'm not sure i would translate it as as that i, I think there's a sense of untrustworthiness perceived untrustworthiness you know what i mean you know, and that's, the, of course, the issue, too, there, right? Or did God, uh, was God wrong to pick these people, right? You know, that sort of issue, too, yeah, you know, because I mean, he's got to deal with that, too. We've kind of moved on from the whole pistis word group, just the English word belief does not do it just. No, it doesn't. No. At all. This is, and, and so that's why I wanted to ask you about it, because this is going to come up and we're going to get off in the weeds. Um <laughs> Two weeks from now about the faithfulness of or the, the i hate that conversation yeah 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 we'll have to touch that yeah 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 well we can't ignore it people we expect, could <laughs> we, we could just assume it right yeah Be, just going back faith of christ you know just move on yeah in or of you know that's that's going to be a whole faith or faithfulness right belief oh, yeah. yeah the whole 
whole conversation that we're previewing now. So yeah, um, this is a, also a thing that gets glossed over in a lot of, definitely a lot of uh, old perspective, definitely a lot of um, sermons on Romans, on this section of Romans. Uh, what then is circumcision, positive, negative, or neutral? People don't even want to, people never even thought to ask that question. That's what you ask when you do exegetical stuff. You have to, every everything's a why or it's like, what is it? Who, what, where, why, when? Like, you got to ask those questions. Those are baseline extra, you know, what benefit is there? You know, like if, how does that all work? You know, and it's like, that's just a question. Like, And I'm not even certain how I would answer that. Um, I think it's, I, in my mind, it's like, I think it's, I think it's, it's a sign of faithfulness to God. And I think it should be honored but it shouldn't be required. It does. It's not relativized or neutralized, but it is contextualized. I, I don't think that it's negative. I think this ties back into 25 through 27. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you guys are smarter it, than me. It's, oh. it's, um, <laughs> I was going to say, well, from that alone, I would, I would have said like, Oh, it sounds kind of neutral there. Like versus 25 through 27 of chapter two, but then, given Paul's answer after he mentioned circumcision, it sounds positive. So yep. I, I, if, I couldn't if, conclude if you, it's negative. Well, it's positive. If, if you um, practice Torah, mm -hmm. it um, becomes undone. It becomes uncircumcision. Uh, if well, you, I mean, uh, that, that begs the question. What Not begs the question in a negative way, but if, um, if a Jewish person becomes, you know, affirms Jesus as their Messiah and becomes a Christian, do they still have to abide by that? My answer is um, no, um, unless Paul makes you do it like Timothy. <laughs> so conscience. Well, that's where I, I just go. It's contextual. At that point, I, just, I leave it to the spirit. The spirit, let yeah. the spirit move you. If you feel conviction it's, and you want to do that, aura, by really. all means. Yeah, you know, it's out of at that point, because what Paul's point is, is that, that that identity marker is great if you're upholding your end of the covenant. It's completely undone and becomes uncircumcision if you don't and the problem is um an, an uncircumcised gentile can be circumcised uh not outwardly but inwardly of the heart which is what paul's saying by the spirit by the spirit yeah, yeah as he says by the spirit not the letter and so uh, the answer is is it positive yes mm -hmm. is it negative yes definitely not neutral i just go it depends What's the purpose of mm -hmm. what's the purpose? Yeah. Is it a good thing? Yes. Is it a bad thing? It can be. That's be right. It's just kind of like, you know, it's like Romans 11. Be careful that you don't get too puffed up. Beware. Be self-reflective. Be, be holy. We'll go the Wesleyan route. Be holy. There we go. I like that. All right. Verses three. <laughs> Let's move along here. Hour into it. We're, um, we're coming up on the halfway point <laughs> with this section. Uh, God's entrusting faith. Um, what is that? What then? If some do not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. The stew. We kind of talked about this a bit already. The only thing would be at the bottom the um, uh, the Psalm uh, fifty one four or partial or half citation of the Septuagint, and I have it right. Yeah, but there's also another. It. There's also another echo here. Uh, I saw that. I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't entirely sure uh, to include that. So if you have it or you know what it is, go ahead and let us know. I got to go double check on Nolan. I'll still be here. But I didn't did not include that because it didn't seem to be it was an echo, but it didn't seem to be as overt as this actual half citation there. But I'll kick it to you. I'll be right back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't write it down because I didn't make the PowerPoint. Had I made the PowerPoint, I would have definitely added that in there. But well, then you can do the PowerPoint next time. <laughs> no, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to leave it out. I, wasn't it Deuteronomy something? Um, oh my gosh! Yeah, it's Deuteronomy something. All right, I'll, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, Deuteronomy something. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, so this is introduced with a formula: the as it is written, which. And I think this is uh, pretty much um, almost verbatim here, um, if I'm not mistaken. So that you are judged when you speak and blameless when you judge. And of course, there's a lot, a lot of questions because this comes following the statement of um, 
God's faithfulness is not undone by human failure. Mm -hmm. Right. But it says, you know, far from it, rather God must prove to be true, though every person found a liar as it is written so that you are justified in your words and prevailed when you are judged. Mm -hmm. So the, the you here, <laughs> um, interesting citation here because it does go back to what we speak, uh, what I was touching on earlier. So, so if you're the interlocutor, you're thinking either God's failed, Paul's wrong, or God is in a very awkward position, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Paul marshals this, that even if you want to put, so Paul's going to, you know, Paul, my position is correct. So therefore um, he's going to marshal this to show that even if someone takes a shot at it, he quotes this to support himself and saying uh, the words of God, there's righteousness there. It's, it's going to be upheld. And then also if anyone wants to criticize it, God's going to be blameless. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of a, what, 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 this is a rhetorical jab. This marshalling of this text is a rhetorical jab that if, if you, if you want to start questioning God, uh, according to if, if what Paul's arguing is true, um, God's going to, God's going to come out of this looking just fine. That's, that's the flow of the text. Do you agree with that? Uh, Nick, did you hear a word of it? No, I'm saying Paul brought this. this I had to go be a dad for five seconds. Be nice. That's, to me. Well, I mean, I'd rather Nolan be here than you. But I'm saying yeah, the, reason why Paul, the, the reason why Paul used this specific text is the first part pertains to the words of God are going to be true. Every man a liar. And the second part and the blame is when you judge. The reason why he likes this is because if the interlocutor is trying to put either Paul's wrong or. God's in a very awkward situation here. Paul's using this text to show that, no, when people try to bring that against God, not necessarily me, because Paul's going to be on God's side. He's saying, it has to be. when people judge, God's going to come be vindicated. So, mm -hmm. you know, people, people often forget. Um, uh, what's, the context of, what's the context of Psalm 51? Tell us. David uh, and Bethlehem. David and Bathsheba. So the very first, the first reference. Uh, I'll just start in verse one. I just thought it was. I just noticed it. I was like, oh, everyone knows. Verse, everyone knows verse five, right? Yep. Because yeah, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithfulness, according to the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my wrongdoings, wash me thoroughly from my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my wrongdoings and my sin is constantly before me against you. You only have I sinned. <laughs> Yeah, good for you, bud. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. It's but it's a, it's a, the the last two sentences are the actual um, citation. I don't know why they translated it differently. You think that the NSB for all its literalism would want to make those things harmonious, but you know, we should. I, I would, uh, God's the impartial judge. Yeah, every God is the impartial judge. He's not in an awkward spot here. God judges kings, Jewish kings, that he beloved is considered uh, beloved, a man after God's own heart. God judged him too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, so did the no Jewish partiality. people. If, if, you read, if you read Kings and Chronicles, anytime, most of them were terrible kings, and when they died, everyone was happy about it. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're, You didn't want to be a king in Israel. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny because like um, every, <clears throat> the original sin, this is one of the proof texts, the very next verse um, in sin, my I was you know in sin, my mother conceived me, and that's one of those texts that everyone and they, they go to Romans five, and then they go to Psalm fifty one five, and all of that. And so, I always yeah, think I that yeah, they they right. they don't look at you know they look at that verse, but they don't read the whole thing, and they don't they don't notice that you know what's going on here. Yeah, I, I prefer original death leading to sin versus original sin, but I'm, well, I'm old school so, that so way. So do I, and so does the entire Eastern Hemisphere of Christianity. But mm. would, would would you guys say? Sorry, this just occurred to me. But in Psalm 51, do you th like David's like rejoicing in God's judgment over him, almost like praising God for the judgment that He places? Or would you say that's going a little too far? I think he's resigned to it. 
basically mm. it, it's kind of like job like it's kind of like the famous ending of job it's like and job repented no job melted job just kind of was like i'm undone basically god will do what god will do and i think here that's kind of david's attitude it's a, it's an acknowledgement of sin and wrongdoing and the consequences of sin and god will judge even the great and mighty warrior king yeah i mean yeah. he does he does acknowledge like the hyssop is a disciplinary term right there right mm -hmm. yep. um so he he is acknowledging um the fact that there will be consequences, but yet he still rejoices. I ask that because anticipating getting into verse five of Romans chapter three, whenever, you know, they do look at God's judgment as, you know, the evidence of his righteousness, I was like maybe the, maybe the Psalm 51 kind of led into that pretty well, if, if that's what David was doing. But like I said, just, just looking and trying to speculate a little. Yeah, no, I think you're onto something there. That's why you have to, Depending on your view of the New Testament use of the Old Testament, um, some people take atomistic readings and some people think that, no, that doesn't work. You have to you have to look at the broader context of the whole passage and what's going on there. But you also have to do that in light of the Christ event. And that's one of the things that people people leave out when they start looking at um, the, old, the, the New Testament use of the Old Testament. It is a remix, which is why... You have to you have to think of that in light of the Christ event. How some of that gets remixed. So uh, this that's is why you need apocalyptic, baby. That's why you need apocalyptic. It solves yeah, all of this. I knew the word was coming. <laughs> you have to remember that the fulfillment in of how these Old Testament things get get fulfilled in Christ is not what's expected, and too many people want a one-to-one -one correspondence instead of a one-to-one point five correspondence. It's going to be a little bit, you know, that, that doesn't mean, oh, they, the Old Testament prophets got it wrong. No, that's not what it means. What it means is it's going to be fulfilled in the way that God sees fit in light of Christ. And that, mm -hmm. that, that gets lost because the Christ event shatters expect. I mean, one of the reasons why they crucified him is <laughs> he, he was not the Messiah they had wanted. He's the Messiah that they needed, not what they mm -hmm. wanted, right? So, yeah, you're on to this because now that this is in the backdrop, and I'm glad that you brought this up, um, that God, you could still rejoice in that. So this idea of God being unrighteous when he inflicts wrath um, because God looks good by doing it when we're bad, why would that be a bad thing? That argument is like, um, you know, the, the, that far from it overturns that line of reasoning. Mm -hmm. the, well, that God hey, doesn't show partiality and judgment. I mean, thank right. God for yeah. that. If we apply that pastorally and theologically, there's a lot of churches that are uh, thinking that they're going to skate by on judgment day. I'm like, oh, boy. But here's Good that luck thinking that. But here's the Pritchett Prime thing that goes back. And I know that, that this is what he says in verse 8, but I think it applies to verse 5. The Jewish interlocutor hasn't forgotten his Bible either, right? Mm -hmm. He knows that God is not unrighteous and would never say... He's trying to saddle Paul with this, right? That's, the interlocutors are trying to saddle Paul with this because let's be fair to his opponent. Paul's not straw manning, so I don't think... So what we need to understand is they are saying these things to make Paul look bad because no Jew would think that, oh, our unrighteousness demonstrates God's righteousness. So God is unrighteous if he judges us because we're just making him look good. Paul's interlocutor doesn't believe this. But Paul's interlocutor is saying this to make Paul look bad. And well, so it's like Paul when they came to talk to Jesus about divorce, they don't they know their Bible. Mm hmm. So what you got to understand here is Paul is when he says, may it never be, make a note to however, however you want to train. I like the, uh, what is the cotton patch version translates as hell no. <laughs> oh, that, that's like, the Methodist way. Yeah, the Methodist way is Paul says, hell no. Hell no. Uh, <laughs> that's, but what was that Clarence, somebody that did the cotton patch Bible? Uh, you, have, you, have you ever read that? Oh, it's fun. Oh, hell no. Uh Perhaps he rewrote, he rewrote Romans for country folk and it's addressed to Washington instead of Rome. <laughs> go, yeah, I I 
all 12 of you currently watching, go Google the Cotton Patch Bible and bookmark it. It's and, and go to Romans. It's a lot of fun. Um, but, but yeah, so that's, that's my take. Um, Nick, are you kind of on board with the primism that I don't think that, that this statement, um, our unrighteousness, that Paul's heard this before. Do you think that Paul's objector is asking this in a sincere way? Because I don't. I, I think, Paul, I don't know. Um, I think it's a very reasonable question, if, especially if you tie five and eight together, you know, as kind of, uh, as kind of bookend, bookmarks of that. Uh, obviously, seven, you know, is there. Um, no, but I'm but saying... I, but, but, but I, no, I think it... Go ahead. No Jew, no Jew, no Jewish interlocutor would accept the premise that unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, so God would be wrong to punish our unrighteousness because it makes him look good. They're trying to, my, my argument is they're the reason why they bring this up is to saddle Paul with that position. Not that they're asking this in as something that they would believe, but something they want to slander Paul with. Right. But it's not a good faith question. Yeah. It's not yeah, a good faith that, question. There we go. That, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Do, does our hypocrisy nullify God's sincerity? Hell no. Let God remain true, and even if it makes a liar out of every man, to quote the scriptures, I'm like, yeah, that that's good old countryness right there. I like it. All right, <laughs> yeah, because because I mean, you know, now what do you make of the parenthetical? For how yeah. for then how could God judge the world? Verse yeah, five. let's let's look at this. Um, no, which the, which part? In verse five. Yeah, the human viewpoint. Yeah. Oh, I speak according to yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I remember reading a few different commentaries after I couldn't figure it out and didn't really like either any of the options they put forward. I, I just put it, I don't. Yeah. So it's one of those where I'm like, I'm not sure how I. I, I get I get echoes of Galatians one, but I also don't think it's a it's a comparable situation lit, from a from a literary perspective. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to do with. I'm speaking from a human. I mean, <clears throat> let's, let's I, have, I mean, from a. I'm speaking. You know, it's just anthropos, right? I'm speaking in accordance with man, human. Yeah, and so you look at maybe here. Uh, buy buy me some time. I'll look. At, I'll see if there's any parallels well, real quick. I'm glad so. you guys are saying this because that's how that's that's kind of how I was looking at it as I was reading through this, I'm like, I I'm not exactly sure what he means by that. I was, I was kind of thinking like maybe what he's saying is something like maybe from a, a thin human perspective of what would probably make sense on the surface void of the bigger scope of how God works. But yeah, uh, I see it in, if I had to take a pick, I see it as a negative statement. Um, because going back to verse five, a not being a good faith question, mm. right? So I don't. Yeah, you mean it like whenever people online say, "Oh, that's just according to your human logic," that kind of thing. I, yeah, I, I I don't know what that means either. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I don't. I, that's man's reasoning. Just, God's is above yeah, us. I'm just curious what Paul's doing here with the, with this little aside. I am speaking from a human viewpoint. Uh, does he mean his, I mean, is that, is that a let the reader understand thing? <laughs> you know, I mean, it that, could, it could be, I, I mean, to put it paraphrastically, I'm speaking according to y'all's stupid paradigm. That's incorrect. See, that's what I'm thinking. Well, no, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm speaking from the paradigm you're trying to shove on me. If anything. Well, I'm, I'm being paraphrastic. Paul's being sassy. He's allowed to be sassy in, in the Nick Quint edition of, of the text. But I, I think, yeah, I'm speaking in accordance to your think your way of thinking because kata you know anthropon often has that sort of man centered is not the right term because obviously we all know what that's how that's used but you're thinking you're, you're looking at it like this when you should be looking at it like this you're looking that's at right. it like this and so i think that's kind of he's like your 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 question is incorrect because it's the circle you've drawn 
is too small. You need a bigger paradigm to, to understand what's going on here. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, I've seen that uh, in the commentaries, but it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that goes far enough because again, this could just Well, be usually anthropon would be in conjunct or in, in uh, contrast to like flesh, right? But you, at that point you would be using uh, sarca or, or flesh versus yeah. spirit, flesh and spirit. You don't have that here. But if it's being used, and Colossians uses the similar constructs, you know, according to human precepts is how they often render it, to human kind of conceptions of, it's, it's so it might be, you might be thinking, epistemology is too loaded of a term, but you might be thinking in terms of, um, according to how uh, how a person who doesn't agree with me would think. Yeah, and, but I, I still think, the, he, I, I, I like your uh, little song and dance that you just did there because I, I think there's a little bit of snottiness with the, yeah there's a little bit of snottiness here because i because i think he's gearing up um with you know the far from it may it never be heck no hell no however you want to translate make it to, but it just seems like he's 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 doing a little song and dance here to say i'm speaking from the this human standpoint this and an agonistic culture I think he's it, there's a little bit of mockery here because he doesn't because he knows that this is a bad faith bad faith objection. Well, and if it's a bad faith objection, maybe there I don't I don't know how well this works in the Greek, so obviously you guys speak to that, but some of the translations are saying something along the lines of I am using a human argument. Yeah, but I, but I, but I think Paul's trying to represent Yahweh and then say that so Yahweh, like Yahweh, Yahweh, is, Yahweh is righteous. He's dealing with a bad faith interlocutor. He's been slandered, and he's saying this. I'm speaking with a human argument or a human viewpoint or whatever. He's trying to. It's a snotty remark that yeah. back to his interlocutor that this is Here. something you don't. This is a bad faith question. You don't believe it. You know I don't believe it. This is not my view. And guess what? So I'm putting you on this. Uh, here, here. This will be fun. This will get Bottom me in trouble. Up. He is speaking. Imagine if he's speaking to a Calvinist here. If <laughs> God constructed this a certain way, da da da. Is God unrighteous to do this? And Paul's like, "What a dumb question." And I'm not saying Calvinists are dumb, but that's kind of the you know. It's like, well, you. It's basically yes, you it's doing the sovereignty thing. You know, are you yeah. saying God is not sovereign because God can't? You know, da da da. And Paul's just like, "Hell no! What are you talking about? That's it's not a good faith question." You know, just to give people kind of a sense of like, imagine if this is a Calvinist argument, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust and bringing his wrath upon us. And it's like, well, if predeterminism and all these sorts of things are true, hell no. Like that doesn't yeah, I should have never brought up that cotton patch version of. Maybe yeah. No see, now this is your, that's all your fault. You get doing, to wear that one. You're going to be doing that all night. Um, <laughs> Y'all. Clarence Jordan, I think was his name. Yep. Um, but I think that's what he's got. Just to, the Calvinism idea is just to give, like, apply it to something that people in the chat probably know a bit about. Oh, well, duh, there it is. You know, kind yeah. of thing. So I, I think he, I think there's a little bit of mockery here in this parenthetical. But I, I didn't want to just, but see, folks, you and the audience get bored when we go on these derailments. We'll just say this train. Der but see, I, we want to know all of this, and we, I'm reading about. 12 commentaries to, to, to get ready for these Thursday nights, just reading those sections of them. Uh, Nick's I, I'm doing a lot of catch up because I'm not a Paul guy like uh, Nick is. So I'm having to read all this stuff. And sometimes you just don't know what to make of things. So that's why doing this in community with uh, at least more than one person with the three of us helps us get, get these, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's better than just independent study. So I like to have the multiple voices, even though, uh, MJ hasn't shown up. Chris hasn't shown up. Braxton's had not shown up. Uh, Alex has been missing. And I'm going to have to send these people like, hey, now it's it's becoming a white boy club again. I can't have that. <laughs> um, all right. Quota, quota so first six. Um, yes. Uh, we've done the 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 uh, the the naughty word that Nick can't get over uh, for Otherwise, how would God judge the world? That that's um, Paul's retort. Mm -hmm. And we because, should actually include. We should render that as cosmos too. That's not just the world. That's creation things. As cosmos yeah. gets used throughout Romans too. That's creation. 
like including us human beings. So it's it's a bigger picture thing. A little bit apocalyptic lore there. Second Temple Jewish apocalyptic lore right there. Just one of those yeah. things I noticed. Yeah, I mean this is this this is why I think is a bad faith question that Paul's asking a bad faith question back. He's like, yeah. So if God is un if if God's unrighteous for judging people just because his righteousness, you know, uh, is highlighted when our unrighteousness has it coming, he's like, look, dummy, how could God judge at all? Exactly. But the idea that God is judge of the world is a thing that Paul and his interlocutors share in common. And mm -hmm. so he's, this is, I mean, this is almost a, I mean, they can all go back to won't the, the Lord God of all the universe judge right. I mean, they all have that in their mind. They know that God is going to judge eschatologically. They all have eschatological expectations. Paul too, at this point, in the <clears throat> mid to late fifties, he's thinking, you know, they're still in this, this um, apocalyptic unveiling they're in the midst of it, right? So they all have that on the brain. They all have judgment on the brain. I mean, even Plato, since Phaedo and uh, Gorgias and all these things, for 400 years they have had, uh, well, whether it's personal eschatology when you die or at some point, you're going to be judged by the gods or God. So even the Gentiles were primed for a judgment according to your deeds. I mean, you can go read about that in Plato. Uh, in, in the mythological aspects of Plato's dialogues. So this idea that God's going to judge the world, Paul is uh, this this human argument. He's shoving it back in their faith like, duh, I mean, uh, uh, of course, of course not, because God is going to judge the world on both of our views, right? Mm -hmm. So that th that's what I think is going on there. Uh, this is... A, I mean, this is why I think it's it's good if somebody can get animated when you when when you read this because I I, I think what's going on in this diatribe, this is almost a you know, this is not the the kind of I mean Paul's been this is where I will agree with Douglas Campbell. Paul has been engaging this real world experience, raising these objections and addressing them. People trying to slander him, make him look bad. It's happened to his face in and out of synagogues. And so this isn't merely, and one of the things that we didn't bring up um, that, that, that they talk about with the diatribe style is standard diatribe is they're trying to, uh, you know, bring you along and educate you and all of this kind of stuff. But Paul's in a fight here. And I think that that gets lost that this is a diatribe style, but Paul is not merely trying to educate. He's also trying to beat back bad uh, misinformation and disinformation about his ministry. Right. Well, because Paul cares about his, his reputation, but if what he says about God is based on how people view him or don't understand him or misunderstand him or lie about him, then he's going to take that personally, specifically because he's had a direct revelation and apocalypse of Jesus Christ, as Galatians says. And so right. it, is, in his mind, he's tied to himself to, to Jesus Messiah. And he's like, you ain't taking you ain't taking me away. So you better listen to what I have to say. And so yeah, he's getting this into that, too. This diatribe is very agonistic. It has that challenge repost feel mm -hmm. that Jesus had in his actual encounters with the Pharisees. Yep. This is this is he is trying to slam back these dumb objections in the hardest way possible so that he can increase his honor rating to his audience in Rome. That is why it it people are like, well, you can, how can how you can get that from just words? I mean, how do you not? Why do I? And, and I think there's textual clues here, which I mean, we have the benefit of reading beforehand. But Paul is saying these things because he knows that his audience has heard things. That's all, why mm -hmm. that background information is important when you're trying to do because we're low context readers. We have to do more background research so that we can get to something understood between Paul and his audience in these churches of Rome, they've heard some bad things. Imagine it like this, right? Just for folks, mm -hmm. you're, you're a pastor, you're a minister, and you are, I'll use myself an ex as an example, just because I know myself and I know my social context. I'm a pastor, egalitarian, all these sorts of things. But when it comes to certain issues, I am very, very conservative and I have a reputation for that. If there is a gathering of pastors in my area, uh, and I walked in and pe and people knew who I was. My reputation precedes me. They know what I think. They know what I don't think. They know if they like me or not. They've made, they've never met me. They never shook my hand. They, they know nothing of me. And so when you walk into a room or you write a letter, you're going through all this and you intend to go to a place, your reputation, your honor rating 
precedes you. And so people have already formed a whole lot of stuff about you. Like, Derek, you're on, social, you're on Twitter all the time saying stuff. I bet you 90% of the people that sat down and shook your hand, different, per, different perceptions change. You know what I mean? Same thing, with, same thing with the rest of us. You know, um, but Paul is having to deal with that. Paul says all this stuff on Twitter. Paul says all this sort of stuff. People say all this stuff about him. Then he suddenly has got, or X, I'm not calling it X. You know, forget that. You know, he, he goes and says all that. Then it's different that Paul says, I want to come and I want to break bread with you. And they break bread and it's like, oh, well, you said all these things. And now this makes a lot more sense. The flesh and blood behind it. And so Paul is probably annoyed that he has to spend so much time on this because at the end of the day, these are slanderous things about him. These aren't true. We know his gospel. We, and this is born out of pastoral conflict and theology and ethnic and racial issues and gender issues and, and socioeconomic uh, economic and status issues. Like all those things are fomenting literally in Paul's brain as he writes this very intensive, condescending, and I mean condescending constructively, you know, diatribe. He's, he's taking it to them because he's sick and tired of having to deal with this from people who should know better. And it's not that the Roman church has been saying this, but it's like, what have you heard about me? Mm -hmm. Let me set the record straight because I only got one letter to do this. And by the way, I'd still like a little bit of funding to uh, go to the pagans in Spain, um, if you guys don't mind. <laughs> so there's all that. There's all that sort of subtext in what he's saying here. This isn't just he's going after the Jews because they're arrogant, you know, in the kind of old perspective says, oh, the Jews are bad. He's like, he's not, he's, that's not that's not the main point. None of that's the main point. He's dealing with the character of God that he proclaims and that he's tied himself to. Both their reputations are on the line. If you slander him, you got a real big problem because Paul's mission to the Gentiles falls on the basis of his character and God's character. It's mm -hmm. not that they're linked and that they're identical, but if, if people can look at Paul and go, yeah, I've heard about you, you're fine, but your God, he, he severed his thousands and thousands of years of history for us. Really? What about how can he be called faithful to, the, to his covenant if he broke it for us and left all those thousands of people off to the sideline? You know what I mean? He's got to deal with all this. This is a remarkably pastoral letter theologically. And we miss it when we go, oh, this is systematic theology. And Paul is taking down the Jews. It's like, no. I mean, a little bit here rhetorically, obviously, but no. Like, it's, eh. So that's why I'm like, the whole perspective just makes me so mad because I'm like, guys, like, you're not reading this. You mm -hmm. got a systematic and you're not reading it. There's all there's a there's a social world of this text. That if you don't understand that, as Pritchett and I have been saying, if you don't understand that, you're going to read this like a modern systematic theology textbook. And that is not how Paul wanted it to be read. You are being postmodern when you read it like that. Stop it. Postmodernism oh, wow. bad. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so, Sorry, I put David Allen there for a second. <laughs> yeah. Verse 7, a lot of folks just want to treat this as a restatement of verse 5. But... He switches up the language to lie and truth. And glory. Notice that. And, yeah, and glory. So I, I think this is another bad faith question. But it's interesting that Paul frames it in this, this kind of way, because there, there's been this talk of truth and lie all the way back in chapter one. Which is why I said he's primarily denouncing the Gentile world, summing up the polemic standard finding wisdom of Solomon 12 through 15, whatever. But that's why it's also relevant to the Jews because, you know, through my lie, the truth of God abounded to his glory. Why am I also still being judged a sinner? Um, what does this sound like? Come on, fellas. What does this sound like? Why am I also still being judged? Why does he still find fault? Oh, yeah. yeah, no. Yeah, it sounds like Romans 9. It sounds like, I mean, it sounds like a bit of Romans 5, you know, condemned as sinner, you know, hamatolos, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think condemnation, this... glory, like, it's all, all this is going to come back later, guys. You well, I think, I think verses 5 through 7 mirror a lot of Romans 9. Uh, well, not a lot of Romans 9, but Romans 9, 19 through 20, specifically. Mm-hmm. So what again? The question, good faith question that somebody on Paul's interlocutor was asking. More, Paul? it's a more precisely worded bad faith question. Right, bad faith. It's a bad faith question. I want this well, on. Everyone agrees with me. This is a bad faith question. I want that down. Or, or to be positive, it's a misguided 
question. But I, I think those two things aren't mutually exclusive. But you'll notice a bounce to his glory. If God, it's like I love the idea that God somehow benefits intrinsically from sinful things like falsehoods. Yeah, but but look I'm at like, verse I, eight. But look at verse eight. Look at verse eight. Yep. Instead of going another Meganoto, or as Clarence hmm. would translate it, heck no. <laughs> there, thank you. Braxton will be happy. I'm sure. I'm, okay, I'm sorry, Braxtaddy, my bad. Okay, and what he I'm says is, and me. why not say, and why not say, Paul's just going to add to this interlocutor's question. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're asking the question. I'm, I'm answering it for you, the interlocutor, Paul. It's Paul. Instead of going another round of heck no, he's saying, that not only did the interlocutor say that, but why not just say this? As we are slanderously reported as some claim that we say, let's do evil so that good may come of it. What is he, what is he some of these? Their condemnation is deserved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Why is that important? I think it's a bad faith question. Mm -hmm. Because oh. in verse 19, I think this is a, I think verse 19 of Romans chapter 9 is also a bad faith question. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of. What I, if you will say to me slanderously? Then why does God still blame us for who can resist His will? Well, that's not that's not just slander. That's bla that's the blasphemia word group. That's blasphemia. That's false. Like that's cursing. That's false language. That is just you don't want. Paul's handed people over to Satan in one Timothy two, one Timothy one for that. <laughs> you know, so they might learn not to blaspheme. Give them over to Satan for that. It's like guys, like this is bad. I'm with you, Pritchett. I, I think it's a misguy interpreted fairly fairly or interpreted positively it's misguided interpreted as it seems to be this is a yeah i'm with you i think um we're well, saying yeah. they're, they're they're using these human arguments and these, uh, they're doing it to slander paul which means they're bad faith questions that neither neither oh, he, hey Pritchett, paul? Pritchett, you know why you know why you know i i got a new sorry to go back a sec a step i know why he says according to to human Okay. Because they're asking, and this is going to sound so trite and stupid, and I feel dumb for saying it, but I feel smart also, because they're arguing anthropocentric, anthropo, anthropocentric, man centered. They're man centered. Why? What is it? We got words worse than me and Leighton Flowers. Oh my gosh. Anthropocentrically. Anthropocentric. But here, but through my lie, my lie, why am I still considered? If through my lie, why am I? consider if our unrighteousness what shall we say during his wrath on us it's it's about talking about themselves that's yeah. anthropocentrism that's why he says i'm speaking in i'm making that's another aspect or shade you know diamond shaped to to the you know the kata anthropon it's just you're basically you're talking about yourselves you're not talking about god and you're slandering god by talking about yourselves in this way Right, and and you're asking bad faith questions that you don't believe mm -hmm. and i don't believe either and it tells us that god is not glorified by sin Right, but and, and think course, about that theologically. And of Some course, the Jewish, and of course, the Jewish interlocutor doesn't believe that God is unrighteous for judging. Doesn't believe um, that they shouldn't be judged as a sinner when they sin. He doesn't believe that, which is why Paul doesn't accept the premise here. Notice that Paul does not accept the premise. He doesn't even bother saying. He doesn't even bother to defend himself because he already has. He's already said, uh, "Heck no." Um, he's already said that he's already, so now he's just kind of blowing it off. He's just like, and why not just go even further jerk? <laughs> well, it's like Galatians. Why not just cut the whole thing off? Yeah. Why not just say mm. it? We're slanderously reported as some claim we say, right? And I bring all this up to say that when, when the interlocutor asks a bad faith question, I think Romans nine nineteen is a bad faith question. And why does he, or who is able to resist his will, both Paul and the interlocutor know that God's will can be resisted. It's a bad faith question. It's a deterministic premise that Paul doesn't accept. And he says, who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? He's blowing it off, just like he's blowing this off. Well, and it, it gets back to Romans 3 or 3. What if some were untrustworthy with how they acted? Yeah. What but if our, some acted our, in our bad Calvinist faith? Friends, our Calvinist friends don't pick up on this. And uh, our Calvinist friends take the position of a slanderous interlocutor who's intentionally asking bad faith questions. Well, it's, it's, is, it, is it akin to, to, to siding position. with Job? Huh? Job's, is it akin to siding with Job's friends yes. instead of Job? 
Yes. And I love my Calvinist brothers and sisters. Don't get all Haiti. Just, just this don't is the even... interlocutor's bad faith questions where neither the interlocutor nor Paul accept the premise. Paul never accepts the premise of his interlocutor until it's a Gentile. And then he qualifies his uh, fair enough, but don't get arrogant. So, right. So he is like, like Nick said earlier, God is, or Paul is establishing God is not glorified through sin. God doesn't need sin to be glorious. And exactly. thus, I also, I don't think God does sin. I just don't think God does sinful things. Right. And there are certain systematics that might run up against. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Or or would condemn, you know, the sinner. You know, it's like, but if we kick it back, if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. And I'm like, hold on now. Careful. Whose side are you on? The interlocutor or God and Paul? Mm -hmm. Right. And I love and I'm just saying. And And these are bad faith questions that the interlocutor doesn't believe. But once Paul's position to lead to this because they're the ones who are straw manning and throwing out these bad faith questions in an attempt to slander Paul and say, this is what you have to believe. And he's like, no way. Well, it'd be like, you know, Hey, Hey Derek, Nick and, um, and, and JP, I heard you're bigots. Do you, do, did you stop? When did you stop being a bigot? And we're just kind of like, I don't accept the premise of this mm -hmm. snarky little question. Right. Yeah. And that's Paul kind of what Paul's doing. That's exactly what Paul's doing. Yeah. That, that's just an example. That's yeah. Wouldn't that be a loaded question? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so uh, Paul's yeah. like, uh, yeah, these people who are running around trying to settle our position with it or Paul's position with this and slander him and try to make these snotty questions that are asked in bad faith. They don't believe it. They know I don't believe it, but they're trying to make me look bad. Their condemnation is deserved, which is why I think he has his interlocutors, primarily the leadership. You know, this would be uh, a guide to the blind uh, going back to chapter two. This is primarily the leadership, but it does. The leadership is representation of the nation that is rejecting the gospel. And so. Verse nine, which we're going to do this week and next week. What um, then shall we say? Are we then? better off? I forgot I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what then? Are are we better than they? Oh, they didn't translate it as. Uh, I like that. Okay, they did. Good, good for you guys. Uh, what then? Are we better off than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now the we. Uh huh. Is this Paul throwing an olive branch, so to speak, to identify himself with his interlocutors? I don't know why it can't be that, or at least as from an aspect point. It's certainly an aspect of it, perhaps. Because, I mean, the, you'll see the ASV has to insert, are we Jews any better off? Yeah. But the text doesn't have, have Jew or Gentile there. It's, are we at any... Um, uh, well, it can't be... Well, uh, do, I mean, yeah. so, so the we here is Paul saying, we Jews. I think so. I think so, too. So I, I think this is kind of an olive branch where he's like, okay, y'all are slandering and I'm done. Your condemnation is deserved. All of that. So what? what's next? Okay. We, better than they, not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now, you what? say this is a parallel text. to, And I'm not a, the biggest fan of... Uh, there's Obviously, Paul's prior letters come to play here, but they're not dealing with the same issues, but there no. is the same language. Mm -hmm. So this parallel text, I don't think that Galatians is a truncated version. I mean, they're two different issues. Galatians, Judaizers, this is just weak and the strong. So it's not like the same things here, but I do, I do like the parallel because it does help us understand, but don't ever think that because you can find parallels with Galatians that, that right. Romans is an expanded Galatians because a lot of people bring the Judaizer issue into Romans, and that's not really the main. Yeah, that that's an old German way of, of thinking about that. Thankfully, yeah. has gone the way of the do, the dodo. Well, not for not for a lot of uh, old perspective folk. Well, but I repeat myself. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so Galatians three twenty two says, "But the Scripture has confined everyone under sin," and this is this is um. It's kind of a parallel. That's paralleled also in Romans 11. God has mm -hmm. signed all under sin so he can have mercy. Amen. So that our promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe, foreshadowing Romans 11.32. 
I, I, this question, oh, Derek, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to punctuate what we were talking about as far as the, uh, are we better? And the, when, the way I read that initially is that he would be talking about like we as in Jews, because he sets up in chapter two about the equal footing in judgment under God. But then he asks, do the Jews have an advantage or what advantage do they have? He explains the advantage, but then he comes back to, but we're all still under sin. They would like we as Jews, even despite this advantage, we are not better. Yeah. You can have an advantage, but that doesn't get you off the sin hook. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is that kind of, there is a reason why the hook is curls back a bit. Uh, I, and I looked at parallel, I tried to find some parallels. I didn't put them in the PowerPoint, but you have Romans six fourteen for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. So there's that aspect. Then Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave uh, under sin, or as sold as a slave underneath sin, um, hoopah plus the, um, plus the uh, accusative indicating uh, position. So I'm underneath it in a subordinate sort of status. And then uh, the closest, yeah, that's, and then Galatians 3. The James has a similar text, but it's hoopah plus a genitive. Um, which means uh, which fulfills something more like by or through or or something like that, not like positionally. Um, so yeah, a, par a better parallel text would be would be Romans sixteen fourteen and Romans seventeen fourteen, which we'll get to um, by next year at this rate. Yeah, you know what I think here. Um, under sin. I, I, well, I think, but people don't know. You got to tell it. I'm not a yeah, mind reader. Is, I'm not your interlocutor. Is, this is the personification of the the um, cosmic power. You know, the idea. This is not understand as in you all have this like canopy of sin, or that you're got sin goo in your blood, or or whatever, or that you are just sinful. Paul is saying you are under this enemy. It's a personification mm -hmm. of a cosmic power. Mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's i call it a demonic sin in this instance and in romans six and seven sin has a demonic function yeah, or has romans has agency it's a live it's a in some sense it's a living thing that's not alive that somehow has mm -hmm. agency and will in the world like yeah. demons do yeah i always capital the same thing with slave to sin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why that's why the the word i was thinking of under sin is sin is our master mm-hmm yeah, it's a, so, personification. So there is a personification there. Right. Sin has yep. three senses. It has a literal sense, right? It has a metaphorical sense, and it has a personification sense. And they're not and they're not all mutually exclusive either. Well, I mean, personification is itself metaphorical, but when I say metaphorical, it's like I'm thinking of he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. So that that's metaphor for like an aggregate. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, just to quote um, a non-imputation text from the Corinthians correspondence, but um, there are no imputation texts. I'll be nice. <laughs> well, we'll have that. We got to get people in here to fight us on that, though. That's true. But um, yeah, the uh, cosmic power is definitely what's going on here under sin you're shut up under this cosmic power that's personified as an evil agent in the world just so to speak because mm -hmm. I, I think it you know when you say state uh, of being that gets into like a different kind of metaphysics well that that's not my thought i'm just i put it there just because i know but that's what people think now because that's what they always think that everything's a metaphysical claim like mm -hmm. when when i say this is a personification of the cosmic power i'm not saying there's metaphysically an entity called sin <clears throat> but I am saying it's, Paul is personifying it rhetorically. I would say he's giving it demonic lungs. Yeah. That, that, like it's, that, it's, it's almost, you might say it's almost a real thing. Not quite a real thing, but almost a real thing. Well, no, it is a real thing. It's just not a I real mean, a thing. real thing, a real living thing. Like, like, yeah, it's, it's that. not a being. Uh, it's not a creature entity. That's what I call it. Yeah. It's a li uh, almost it, a living entity. Yeah. But it, 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 but it is a real thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Paul is serious that there is a cosmic power. He's just not, I, I just, it's a personification of whatever that is. But it's not talking about metaphysics. So, I mean, you know, um, this is talking about. It's not talking about, pixie dust. There you are go. under, like, okay, so you, we, and this is why I don't get people, when people go off the rails in Romans 5. 
Sin reigns. That's a personification mm -hmm. of a cosmic ruler. Mm -hmm. Slave of sin. That's a personification of a slave master. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. It's so it's yeah. Anyway, so well, that's just, just, sorry for clarification. So when when you say that they're that it's being personified, you said that there's not like an entity out there called sin, but would you say the enemy, the demonic forces are encompassed in that in being under sin, like under their power? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. All the mystic. Absolutely. That's the mm -hmm. metaphysics. That's well, the metaphysics that everyone ignores in the modern world. Yeah. Especially in the modern. Because we got event. Wi-Fi and, and refrigeration. We don't have any need for demons. Right. I mean, this well, is a, this is a bad Protestant problem that that when the, the cosmic power is a personification of think of it in the terms of legion, mm -hmm. right? It the, 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 Paul's casting all the demonic forces, Satan himself, all of that onto this personification under the rubric of sin. He's personifying that. Um as a way of speaking about all the powers and principalities that are, you know, mm -hmm. were at war against. Yeah. Well, well, well thinking... and what, what, what is the final enemy in Romans? It's Romans 16. It is for the God of peace will swiftly smash or crush Satan beneath your feet. Mm -hmm. And if that's the final enemy to undergo annihilation, then sin as personified, I, I, I don't know if a personified entity power thing, death, same thing. Um, law fulfilling a, a uh, perverted function within it. So law is not, of course, on the same level with it, but law being used um, perversely and cor through a corrupted means fulfills a sort of taskmaster or slavery yeah, that's function. Why we keep going back to cosmos for world and cosmic. I mean, Romans 8 is bigger than the creature. Yep. Mm -hmm. the well, that's where, you know, God will judge the world. It's not just us flesh and blood. It's the creation everything. is not planet Earth for first century Jews like Paul. Mm -hmm. Now it's everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all the contiguous reality, and both so, visible and invisible. Now mm -hmm. I'm not saying he had our cosmology; he had a first century Jews cosmology. But it's 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 all contiguous reality mm -hmm. is what Paul would mean by creation and by yeah. world. And the reason I ask about being under sin, being like under the powers of the enemy, the demonic, however you want to frame that, is like. Because I was thinking of Colossians 1, 13, 14, where he says he he de delivered us from the powers of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So right there you see kind of like the forgiveness of sins is directly tied to us being delivered from the enemy. And you probably get echoes of that in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, where he talks about mm -hmm. nailing it to the cross, disarming the rulers and authorities. Yep. Exactly. And 1 Corinthians 15 too. The final enemy, the final hostile power to be annihilated is death. Yeah, this is this is a god at war, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why Paul's not playing games in this section here. That's why Paul's apocalyptic. Yeah, he because he, he's got real enemies outside of flesh. We don't make war against flesh and blood, against yeah. the principalities, rulers, and powers. Those no, are real sure things. He can't get snotty with flesh and blood like Paul does. Oh yes, he can, <laughs> and he still will. Yep. All right, uh, have we beat that horse to death? I think we've beaten Paul to death. The poor guy's just sitting there going, like, leave me alone. Let me sleep. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up and try to get it done so we can hit the two-hour mark and let everybody go on about their Thursday evening. Preaching. Well, Derek, you almost you could get into this and probably soon. How would you take this to your church? Not your church, like, specifically, but, you know, if you were to go and do this, what would you – what would you – how would you take this to the Church of Jesus Christ in terms of proclamation and teaching? Well, what I had written down for that, I said, Paul argued in chapter two that circumcision of the heart is what matters because he brings it up immediately in chapter three. What advantage is circumcision? So the question is now, what about physical circumcision? Jews had the advantage of the promises of God, the oracles of God, but they're still liable to God's judgment if they're unfaithful. Jews and Gentiles are both under sin and justification for both of them is found in Jesus Christ. Um, and so to, that's what I've written down as kind of like a framework, but just going over what we've discussed here, I would especially hammer home the under sin part, because I think that's really important because I'm definitely somebody who likes to conceive of preaching as going to war. And I think Nick, mm -hmm. you can probably agree with that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure every you Sunday is D-Day. Day. Yeah. <laughs> every Sunday is D-Day. Yeah. And just because like, like I told you before the stream and you know how I, uh, 
uh, last week or this past week. And I, my son was baptized and I gave him his Bible and I said, here's your sword of the spirit, you know, because I'm like, buddy, what you got to realize is that you're entering into a battle. You're in warfare now. So that's just kind of how I like to like, if there's a way I can frame a passage around something like that, I, I like to do that. Like, cause we're going to go out and dispel the rulers and authorities and the principalities and powers. So, um, <clears throat> So I think it's important to kind of bring home that Jews and Gentiles are both under sin and what does under sin mean? And then you get into the cosmic. I, I like what you guys said, because I, I had written down here that sin entered through disobedience. So sin entered the world through disobedience. That's a cosmic reality right there, that sin is coming into the world and that it is a pollutant because yes. you have no further. Good delivery. word. Yeah, you have no further to look than the kings, like in first, uh, in first and second kings, watching them, like whenever they were rebellious against God, when they were apostatizing, the, all the people were like it, it trickles down, it infects, and so um, I think that's 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 how I'd approach this. Obviously, <laughs> if I had time to prepare it, I would be more bullet point about it, but yeah, yeah. So I, I'll go next. Um, I, Cosine all of that, the the framing of the the cosmic uh, power of sin, that uh, the dominion that that fallen humanity has voluntarily, I will add, aligned themselves and colluded with, right? Um, I don't think that is of necessity. I don't think that it is of divine decree. Every sin that I commit is is somehow part of. A, all encompassing, you know, meticulous, deterministically, whatever. That's all nonsense to us. We are under powers of sin that we have willingly colluded with and offered ourselves as slaves to them instead of what Paul says, becoming a, he's a slave of Jesus Christ, right? And he uses, uh, you know, he, he uses his body, like the war theme, uh, Romans 6, using the members of your bodies as weapons, instruments, weapons of righteousness rather than unrighteousness. And so um, when I'm, if I was teaching or preaching this passage, it is a, a reminder, going back to the thumbnail, that um, the Jew, this goes back to something I addressed last week on Trinity Radio Extra, that um, when Andrew Clavin said some really stupid things about Ben Shapiro, he's like, no, he needs to repent and believe the gospel instead of what it might cost him. He needs to take up his cross because... Jews are in trouble just as the Gentiles are. Unbelievers are all under judgment. And again, this is a reminder to the unbelieving Jews like Ben Shapiro, for example. Um, you have those words in the Old Testament that are all about Jesus according to Jesus and in the light of Jesus and the Christ event. You have to do something with that. And you have to, you have to say, are you going to be... You have to say, are you gonna are you gonna take the position of the interlocutor here, or are you gonna come to the light with Paul? Because you take the interlocutor's position, your condemnation is deserved because you are going to be judged, and you are going to be judged by an impartial God. So the thing is, is we need to show what Paul's saying here is there's a cosmic power that we have colluded with that God is not wrong whether you you had a prior covenant or not. You are in the dock with everyone else, and the solution is, we can skip ahead to uh, verse 21, but Paul's already given us the solution at the top of the letter, so you can just keep preaching Jesus from the very beginning, that Jesus is the resolution to that, and that is God's faithfulness because of all of humanity's unfaithfulness, ungratefulness, Romans chapter 1 through uh, 320. Um, so I would highlight all of that. As far as... Um, Answering the question of satire sarcasm, um, Paul's culture was agonistic. It was very competitive. It was very challenge or post. It was all about combat and competitiveness. And so what I would say is um, know your audience. Paul knows when to be uh, gentle and pastoral. He knows when to be sarcastic and use satire. Uh, Pastorally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when mm -hmm. engaging in bad faith interlocutors. I think that it is appropriate in our world. This the when I was at Biola back in the day, I'm, a, you know, 150 years ago, the buzzword for apologetics was winsome. Mm -hmm. No, you can't always be winsome. And my biggest problem with a lot of Christian apologists, especially the ones who are interested in theology, which what are their names, JP? Name them here. 
I want to hear them. Especially when they're uh, interested in theology, which not enough are. Um, thank goodness that Dr. Hunter and I are. That's why we're apologists that are in, into the Bible. Uh, if you ever hear me speak on apologetics, I don't ever talk about Kalam cosmological arguments because I don't care. I talk about the Bible. Um, but but um, I do care. I, I like the arguments. I just not my thing. Um, uh, this idea of being winsome all the time. The problem with apologists is is they will throw winsome out of the window when engaging in conversations and disagreements with other believers. And then they will fall over to be winsome to people who are outside the faith, hostile to them, while the world is watching. And I'm sorry, our culture now, social media, for better or for worse, has made our culture very agonistic as well, and very sarcastic and satire. And so it is appropriate to rise to the level of your interlocutors and your opponents, and yes, utilize sarcasm and satire in those contexts. Not every context is going to be like that. You will have people who ask good faith, but this section here reminds us that we're preaching a gospel in a war context that is very, very combative. And so that sometimes you have to shut down, not for necessarily for the sake of your opponent, but for everyone listening in. Everything you just said about how we conduct ourselves in these discussions reminds me of my time on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was thinking, too. I'm like, Ooh. But, but you won't bring the hammer down on apostates. You won't bring the hammer down on. Uh, unbelievers who are trying to hit you with a hamper. 316 is answering questions when asked with gentleness and respect towards God, not towards our meekness, not gentleness, meekness and respect or reverence or fear of uh, the Messiah as Lord. If you look at the echoes of Isaiah in that passage, it's not talking about, it says, you know, don't fear them, the, the, the Assyrians, fear God. Who's bringing the here? It's not about fearing. It's not about having meekness and and fear for whoever's asking you a question. That's not the I do. Um, there's a whole message on our channel um, that I gave uh, at, at a apologetics conference. Everyone go watch. I do an exegesis of uh, the one text that apologists quote and barely know anything about is all about first Peter three, uh, 15, but in its context. So go, go check that out, um, on Trinity radio. So, and I want to bring that here because yeah, that, that is very appropriate. So I would bring the attitude to my message that Paul brings. I would co-sign all of that from both of you. I would also, um, focus on the uh, language of liberation or emancipation, that when God kind of pulls us out of sin through his son, through our acceptance of his lordship and faith, that we are essentially given new life. And I don't mean that just in a future sense. I mean that, no, God has called you out of darkness into light now. And the whole point of being a Christian is not to be a, a Christian on Sunday, nor is it to be a passive Christian. It is to present yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Do with me as you would have me do. You know, uh, empower me by your spirit. What, where, where shall I go? What shall I do? You know, that sort of mentality. Um, I would emphasize, and I've emphasized this from the pulpit at, at First Baptist Church of Palos Verdes, is the idea of uh, the systemic and cosmic and interpersonal and personal and individual nature of sin. Sin is kind of, uh, sin metastasizes very quickly. Um, it gets everywhere. It infects everything. It, you use the language of pollutant. I think that's a very apt word for it. Um, and my point is, if all are under sin, then all are in need of the glory of God. In fact, as we'll see in Romans 3, it's not that they, you know, all, all sin and fall short. It's all lack it. All are impoverished in light of the glory of God in, in terms of what we desperately need. And that, of course, is found in the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the sacrifice or the mercy seat, however you want to frame that. But whatever we, we categorize things as, the Christian message is fundamentally a message or a declaration of liberation from sin and bondage and death and decay and, and oppression and violence. And so for me, I would preach the text in that sense that nobody has equal has a, a, has a, um, a foot up on getting closer to the cross that as N.T. Wright has famously said, I think I stand by this is the ground at the foot of King Jesus's cross is level. Anyone can come to him no matter who you are and find redemption and forgiveness. Um, 
And so I would, I would emphasize the, the liberative nature of, of what God has done through his only son, and that through belief in him, you might have eternal life, and that God at the end of the day is glorified in how he decides to be glorified, not through the sins we do, do we find the glory of God. We find the glory of God as the one who undoes the power of sin entirely. And so um, I don't need a cosmic duality of God being glorified by sin. That's why I believe in the devil, as we'll see in Romans 16. So I prefer so to keep a, God and sin separate. We have a statement here. In my view, if I were an eternal being who will live forever in paradise, I would not be bothered by contrary opinions regarding my infinite nature. Well, I don't believe that I have an infinite nature. Um, I certainly don't. Believe but that. yeah, that's a bad theology. But but um, the reason why I'm bothered by contrary opinions is because I do believe that I am going to live an everlasting life. And I want uh, all those people with contrary opinions to be my friend for all eternity and uh, worship King Jesus yeah, in the new heavens and new earth. So, and I believe that God cares how He's represented. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you're taking uh, easy offense at denials of the truth of doctrine, only its weakness in your doubts. Hardly, um, not even close. Yeah, that that that's um, yeah. Bless your brother. Repent and believe the gospel if you haven't. Um, yeah. So next week uh, we're going to pick back up on verse nine again. We won't rehash everything we said here, but it will set up the catena and. Um, if Nick does the PowerPoint wrong, I'll fix it. Uh, I didn't have time to this week, but uh, we do need to take a look uh, just to give you a preview at this uh, stringing together of Old Testament texts. There are the proof texts on the surface that makes a melody of you're all awful going through head to toe. Uh, this is Paul's uh, eyes, throat, mouth, lips, and feet, but it's kind of a head, shoulders, knees, and toes thing, uh, making that you are the totality of you is awful. But the broader context of those passages is a harmony that most exegetes don't pick up on. That so what I hear you saying is you're more qualified to do the PowerPoint than I am. No, I just want to make sure that you bring out the larger context of this, because while it sounds like man is bad, 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 there's a harmony of God is good, 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 that ramps up in the broader context of these very passages to the, uh, the apocalypse that you've been waiting for since we started this to get to in verses 21 through 31. So we got to look at the melody on the text itself and then the harmony in the broader context of these Old Testament passages. I'm saying that more for Nick than just our audience uh, so that he does the PowerPoint correctly. All right. And uh, just for that, you're going to get a lot of small little words in there that you can't see. Fine. I'll take it. I don't have to do the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching. We will see you next time on Trinity radio.